Welcome to My Mind's Eye, an idiosyncratic look at mind and brain and mental disorders, all explored through research, ideas, and even music, but especially through the lens of My Mind's Eye. If you look into My Mind's Eye, My Mind's Eye is not only the title of this video blog, but also a song recent recordings by my band, The Amygdaloids, but more about that later. In my mind's eye. In our first show, we're going to take on the topic of the inner eye, the conscious mind in which we experience the world. Oh yeah. We're very fortunate to have Ned Block join us on this journey. Ned is a colleague of mine at NYU, where he's a silver professor of philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience. He also happens to be a leading thinker on the nature of consciousness. Ned, let's jump right into the eye of the storm and kick things off with the godfather of consciousness, Rene Descartes. He viewed consciousness as an inner theater, where experiences are seen by our mind's eye. Today, we call this the mind-body problem. Tell us what was on Descartes' mind. What is the mind-body problem? The mind-body problem is the problem of why the physical basis of a conscious experience, like the experience of red, is the physical basis of that experience, as opposed to a different experience, like the experience of green, or no experience at all. And this is a problem that um, uh, predates Descartes, but Descartes really put it in the modern form. And uh, there are a number of different responses to this. The two main ones are, there are dualism, the idea that the brain and, and uh, mind are separate uh, existences that uh, have only a very um, distant relation to each other. And physicalism, the view that the mind is the brain. Now some people react, like my colleague David Chalmers, for example, by espousing dualism. I'm a physicalist. I think that you should think of the mind and brain as the same thing, but you have to um, uh, answer the question of why it is that our different concepts of the mind and different concepts of the brain pick out the same things. So where are we today? Have we made any progress on the mind-body problem? One of the, I think, advances that uh, has been made in, in the, on the philosophy end is to realize that this isn't that different from other cases in the history of science where people have had incredible puzzles. Uh, my colleague Tom Nagel um, put it in a way that I think has, had, uh, that has been very important, which is that um, you can have two different concepts, a mental concept and a physical concept, and not have any idea how they can pick out the same thing. One example, but it's a very simple one, is the fact that water is H2O. Now, the concept of water that we have from ordinary life um, is not one that imme it's immediately obvious how it goes together with some kind of chemical concept. But we have found out that when you take water apart, you get these chemicals. And so we know that water is just a bunch of H2O molecules. Well, let's start with water in the wild, so to speak and in large quantities because in our... And I think our problem with the, the mind-body problem is a little bit like that, in that we have these mental concepts and the physical concepts and we don't see how they get together. One of the things you're especially well known for is the distinction between access and phenomenal consciousness. What exactly do we need to know about phenomenal and access consciousness? Phenomenal consciousness is experience. It's the what it's likeness of perceiving the redness of red or the smell of a rose. Uh, access consciousness is a matter of using that perceptual or other, inf other information um, in reasoning and control of action. Sometimes you are aware of a sound, uh, like say when the refrigerator goes off, but also aware that you have been hearing it in the past. Now if there was a time in the past when you were hearing that hum, but it didn't come to your notice. It was something that was, might have been something that was phenomenally conscious, but not something that you were in a position to think about. So that's an example of phenomenal consciousness, possibly without access consciousness. Let's go a little deeper into this. 
What does it mean to be conscious in the phenomenal sense of something that you can't mentally access? Well, the idea would be that there is some perceptual or imagistic quality to it that what its likeness, but something that is you've prevented yourself from being able to um, think about. But it might come out in your dreams or your slips or um, uh, 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 in other ways. And we might be able to have evidence that the brain processes that are going on are characteristic of perceptual experience, but um, are prevented from getting to your centers of reasoning and, and control of action by some powerful repressive mechanisms. Our colleague at NYU, David Chalmers, has called phenomenal consciousness the hard problem of consciousness. Why is this such a hard problem? So the idea of the hard problem is to distinguish between the mind-body problem, as I, I explained it, you know, the why, how it is that the neural base of an experience is the neural base of that experience. Um, to distinguish that from what he calls the easy problems, uh, which are issues to do with the function of consciousness, where we can get a handle on um, how consciousness does certain things that it does. And he's really just pin that hard, the idea of the hard problem is to pinpoint that mind-body problem, that we do not have an explanation. Now he goes on to conclude that the physicalist idea of, of the mind is wrong. Um, whereas I go the other way, I think we've got a big problem to solve, but I'm more focused on the progress we've made and the hope that we, that progress will continue. Ned, a controversial topic is animal consciousness. What do you have to say about this? Well, certainly in the sense of phenomenal consciousness, the what it's like to experience red, I think that the visual, our visual systems are very similar to those of many uh, many higher mammals, especially, um, and I think very likely we have very similar um, perceptual experiences, especially visual experiences, as, as they have. Um, so I differ from some people, though, in that I don't think the frontal lobes are very important. The frontal lobes is where the basis of thought and where we differ enormously from animals, but I think you can have phenomenal consciousness without much in the way of frontal lobe involvement. Um, and so uh, I think we, we, sh we share that kind of perceptual consciousness with at least many mammals. So what about non-perceptual consciousness? Well, like um, emotions? Yes, emotions, for example. I think those have a much larger cognitive component. So I think maybe we're less likely to share those. And so you attributed phenomenal consciousness to primates. But what about other mammals? Well, I think the further you go down the phylogenetic tree, the more doubtful it gets. Once you get to the point of fish, which have very primitive uh, brain and nervous system, I think it becomes doubtful whether they have conscious. Maybe there's not even any answer to the question whether they have conscious or not. What would Tom Nagel have to say about that, since he has this idea of what is it like to be a bat? Well, it's like being a bat. So isn't being a worm or a slug like being a worm or a slug? I think Tom thinks, as do I, that for some animals, or some creatures anyway, there's just nothing it's like to be them. There's something it's like to be a bat. They're not that different from us, but there's nothing it's like to be a slug. One of your many contributions has been to help transform philosophy from a field of ideas to a field that's also interested in testable ideas. Tell us about this. Well, I think what's happened is that many philosophers, especially philosophers of mind, have realized that there are all these interesting things happening in the sciences of the mind, and that they can, those interesting um, results that have come up, can be of use in thinking about traditional philosophical problems. So here's an example. One of the uh, a, a standard philosophical problems is the problem of the speckled hen. How it can be that you seem to see all the speckles on a hen, but somehow you can't count them and you're not sure how many there are, even when there aren't very many of them. Um, now, in some cases, it's because you um, can't remember which ones you've counted, but even aside from that, um, there does seem to be a problem of being able to somehow um, focus on individual things, even though you think you seem to see them all. Well, I think a good, um, um, uh, at least partial solution to this comes from work on attention. Um, it turns out that the grain of attention, the smallest area that you can attend to, 
is larger than the grain of vision, the smallest area of space that you can see. So it's the mismatch between these different grains that uh, explains at least one aspect of the traditional um, uh, speckled hen problem. So how does this insight from the speckled hen problem help us understand the bigger problem, the mind-body problem? So you remember I said from a physicalist point of view, the solution to the mind-body problem, or at least the framework for a solution, is to get to understand how your mental concepts and your physical concepts can pick out the same thing. Part of doing that is making finer grain distinctions both on the mental side and the physical side. So that's why it's important to distinguish on the mental side, for example, between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness, but also why it's important to get a finer grained understanding of the concepts of attention and uh, consciousness and these different kinds of consciousness. So it's, o it's only by making conceptual progress and putting that together with scientific progress that we'll be able to put those things together and solve the mind-body problem. Ned, thanks for joining us today and talking so clearly about one of the most complex and perplexing aspects of human existence, the mind-body problem. I'm sure this problem will be with us for a long time, but thanks to people like you and your colleagues, we seem to be making real progress. I want to close with something I've always found really interesting about consciousness. On the one hand, having a conscious experience is the ultimate example of knowing something. On the other hand, you can't always trust what you think you know. Sometimes the real reasons why we do things are buried deep below the surface. I explored this idea in a song, the title of which is also the title of this video blog. Let's watch Alexi Gambi's music Andrew? video of the amygdaloid okay. song, My Mind's Eye. You can't